All right, let's turn back to Matthew chapter 16 in our Bibles. Back to Matthew chapter 16. We are still uh, doing our introductory lessons on why are we a Baptist church. We've been going through the Baptist acrostic that I have here on the board. We went through half of it last week. We went through the first four, which would be number one. The Bible is the authority for faith and practice. Number two, the autonomy of the local church. The local church makes its own decisions. It doesn't have to uh, look to headquarters somewhere, whether it be in Rome or whether it be in Missouri or in England for its beliefs or for its polity. It goes straight to the Bible and the leading of the Holy Spirit to make its own decisions. Number two, number three, the priesthood of all believers. That's the truth that as Christians, as saints saved by the blood of Christ, we can enter into the presence of God in prayer on our own. We do not need a priest to do that for us. We do not need a human um, person to confess our sins to. We can confess our sins directly to, to the Lord Jesus, we find in 1 John chapter 1. Right. Then we have two ordinances for the local church, which would be the T. The first T, believers' baptism by immersion. And number two, the Lord's Supper. Both of these are um, ordinances of identification or immersion. That baptism is identification with Christ. The Lord's table is commemoration, a reminder of what the Lord did for us at Calvary. Let's go back to Matthew 16, and let's go back to verse 13. It says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But who say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to lead us and to teach us this morning. Holy Spirit, I come to you thanking you that you indwell each and every believer. You indwell us. The moment we placed our faith in the Lord Jesus, you moved in to our spirit. And you are our teacher, you are our guide, our comforter. And I pray that as the author of the Bible, you would show us exactly what you mean in the verses that we'll look at today. Help us, Lord, to understand why we believe what we believe is Baptist. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's continue through the Baptist acrostic. We're going to look at the letter I now. Now this is very important as well. All of them are important. But for the, for the four that we're going to talk about, this is, this is quite essential. Okay, let me just write it down first. Individual soul liberty. Individual soul liberty. Now you're probably thinking, what in the world does that mean? What in the world does that mean? Very good question. This is what I have defined it. Individual soul liberty is freedom of conscience to do God's will according to the Bible. Freedom of conscience to do God's will according to the Bible. 
Now, I put the phrase according to the Bible because there are a lot of sincere believers that say that what they're doing is God's will, but they do not consult what the Bible says about it, about a particular decision that they make. Now, no one can force them, no one can force you, no one can force my, or can force me to believe or to believe what we believe God wants us to do. But there is the caution that whatever we do, it must be in accordance with the Bible. Right. All right? If we truly believe that the Bible is the authority for faith and practice, that means that everything we we do is done through the lens of Scripture, specifically when we're talking about God's will. We're going to look through some Scriptures here. Let's go to John chapter 7. Let's start with John 7. John chapter 7. Brother Hunt, when you get there, can you read verses 16 and 17? John 7, 16 and 17. 16. Jesus uh, answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but His that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God, or whether I speak it of myself. Thank you. Thank you. This is a very important verse because a lot of people want to figure out what God's will is concerning a specific matter. Jesus says here, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. The idea here is, number one, the first phrase, if any man will do his will. Number one, are we willing to do whatever God's will is? That's the important thing. If we're not willing to do whatever God tells us to do, God is not obligated to tell us what His will is. That's why... Another passage of Scripture tells us, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you know the verse, don't you? Mm -hmm. By the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's the right thing. Because of God's mercies to us in salvation, we are obligated. We are, it is right for us, I should say, to be a living sacrifice unto God. Mm -hmm. Do whatever He calls us to do. And once we know, once we have it settled in our heart that we're going to do whatever God tells us to do, we will know. That's what Jesus is trying to say. If we do God's will, He'll tell us what is right and what is wrong. He'll tell us what what uh, direction we should go. Let's go forward to chapter 16 of John. Same book, just a few chapters later. In chapter 16. Chapter 16, verse 13. Let's start there. This is the night before Jesus was to be crucified, and he's talking to his disciples. Something very important it's about the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. It says, verse 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. 
he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. I want to make an important point. These three, uh, four verses give the Holy Spirit a personal pronoun. He. Not it. He. Mm -hmm. He is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. Amen. And it says in verse 13, Jesus said, He will guide us into all truth. Now he's speaking specifically to the disciples. The immediate context is Jesus is telling the apostles, or the disciples here, they weren't apostles yet, disciples, that there will come a time when the Holy Spirit will tell them what to write. We believe the Holy Spirit inspired the Word of God through human authors. This is, I believe, what he's teaching here in the immediate context, that the disciples will know what God wants them to write by the Holy Spirit. Correct. He will not speak of himself, which means the Holy Spirit is not going to say something out of his own will. He will say that which the Father and the Son want him to say. And whatsoever ye shall hear that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. Again, that's talking about inspiration of the Scriptures. But, I think we can make an application to us in 2021. Now we're not inspiring more scriptures anymore. The scriptures are complete. I think we can say that in the affirmative. I think we can say that confidently that we don't need any more scriptures today. We have the complete revelation of God's Word. But, you know the Holy Spirit still wants to teach us from His Word? One of the best things you can do when it comes to doing research on a particular subject is to talk to the author. As a primary source of information on what to do, on what to what it, what is he or she trying to say when any particular author. But here the Holy Spirit is our is the author of the scriptures, and I think we ought to look to him to show us what does he mean by when we're reading a passage of scripture in the morning. Ask him, what are, you, what are you trying to say to me, Lord? It's freedom, again, of conscience to do God's will according to the Bible. Now, with these two, I'm showing there's a balance. John 7, Jesus said, if any man will do his will, that's the, that's the absolute surrender to God's will, whatever it is. And then here in John 16 is the trust. We surrender to do God's will, and we will know what His will is. And then the Holy Spirit is teaching us, and we trust Him to teach us and to show us His will. Now, freedom of conscience to do God's will according to the Bible, I want to make it very clear. It is not a license to sin. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. This is the beginning of the Apostle Paul's introduction to biblical sanctification. He's talking to the Christians in Rome and he says in verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What are the next two words in verse 2? God forbid. Why does he say that? Well, he says in verse 20 of chapter 5, where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. Now, the thinking would be, okay, if sin abounds, grace did much more abound. Does that mean we can live in sin? Paul immediately says, absolutely not. And the Greek of the words, God forbid, in verse 2 is quite strong. Absolutely not. 
No way, Jose, if I can put it in the vernacular today. Absolutely not. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? What does it mean to be dead to sin? It means that we are separated from sin's dominion in our lives. Why? Because we, are, we have a new master. His name is Jesus. When you got saved, you were separated from sin's dominion in your life. Legally speaking, sin has no right to you. But then why do we still sin? We still sin because we allow a former slave master to ruin our lives, to run our lives. Whenever we yield to sin, we are, left, we are allowing a former boss to boss us around. It's like this. Imagine you were working for a particular boss and you were getting, you were working 16 hours a day. That's a long, long day's work, right, Brother Hop? Yes. 16 hours is a long day. You were working for a boss who was on top of you, very meticulous, an overlord of sorts, a busybody. He or she always railed at you if you did anything wrong. They call you up at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and say, they yell at you through the phone, get over here, I need you over here on the double. And then there's a time when you think, you know what, I cannot live working for this boss. I'm sick and tired of this job. I'm sick and tired of, of working 16 hours and not getting overtime. I'm just getting, a, uh, just working for just extra without getting paid. I'm done. And then you tell them, I'm done. I'm giving you my two weeks and I'm done. You... Uh, find another job afterwards, better paying job, a nice boss, he or she is very encouraging and wants to help you in your new job and always encourages you, saying you're doing a great job and you're starting to like this job. It's really great, it's really great. And then out of nowhere, at three o'clock in the morning, your former boss calls you up and says, get, get up here, I need you here on the double. How foolish would it be for you to get dressed and go to your former job? That's what we do when we yield to temptation. We're letting a former boss call us at 3 o'clock in the morning or whatever time he calls us, and we yield. But we're dead to sin, meaning we are separated from sin's authority in our lives. So individual soul liberty is freedom of conscience to do God's will according to the Bible, but it's not a license for sin. Number two for today. Saved church membership. Save church membership. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 2. Book of Acts chapter 2. Good to see you, Lester. How are you? Good to see you, brother. Acts chapter 2. All right, let's look at verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Okay. Save church membership. That's important.
To be a member of the Roman Catholic Church, you have to be baptized. There's never any mention of salvation, of the importance of salvation. They define salvation or justification completely different than what the Bible teaches. That is not what the Bible teaches. We find in this verse, what happens is a progression. Number one, they gladly received His Word. What happened at Pentecost? They were born again. They received the truth. Jesus Christ was the Messiah that they crucified. The very Messiah that God promised from the beginning of the Old Testament and under Pontius Pilate, they crucified him. They were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And then we find in verse, let me look at it for you really quick here. Verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter, Peter preached a powerful sermon, and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? We hear the truth, what are we to do? Peter, the very first thing he tells them, and the only thing that's important for him, repent. Repentance is a change of dependence from dead works or from dead religion to Christ upon the Holy Spirit's conviction of sin. Amen. That's what they did. They got saved, then they were baptized. Because we find in verse 41, they that gladly received His word were baptized. I want, to be, I want to clarify something. A lot of people, a lot of the cults out there will say in verse 38, repent and be baptized, as if it's a two-step salvation, where baptism is a part of salvation. That's not correct. Because in verse 41, it clarifies the order. They that gladly received His Word, salvation, repentance, to Christ, were baptized. Great. So they were saved already. Then they took the immediate step afterwards of obeying Christ, of obedience, is baptism. And then, the same day, they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. These new baptized believers became members of the church of Jerusalem. Saved church membership. Salvation must come first. No unbelievers in the Bible were members of the church. The purpose of this is to keep the church, which is the bride of Christ, pure. Jesus died. He gave His own life for the church. The church is to be pure. And one way it's pure is that all of its members are born again. And baptized, obedient Christians. Then baptism was identification with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. We find that in Romans 6. When someone's baptized, it's a picture of the death, burial, being immersed into the water, and resurrection. Amen. Then membership came afterwards. I do want to emphasize the importance of this, and we'll talk about it when we get to it when we look at it in a more uh, under microscope, biblically. I believe membership is important. Number one, it says here they were added. These 3,000 souls became members or part of the local church that was born in Jerusalem. But membership is a way in which you are identifying yourself with the local church, with a local church, a Bible-believing local church. You submit yourself to the accountability of the local church. 
and you are willing to use your spiritual gift that God give, gave you at salvation within a local church. It keeps us... I'm going to say this. A lot. What's a problem today, a lot of Christians tend to hop from church to church. Either they are members of one particular church and if something is not, not going by what they like, they move on and then become members of another church. Six months here and then a year in another church and then two years over here and then six months in another church. Not establishing themselves, not grounding themselves in a local church Number two, they're not able and or willing to use their spiritual gifts within the local body. Membership allows Christians, number one, legally, from, this, from the, that the, in a church situation, they can serve in the local church and, and legally they can under the state but it gives them the freedom to serve and love the Lord in a local church, serving other believers. Instead of always hopping from one church to another and never establishing themselves spiritually. So that's number two, save church membership. Number three, two offices. Two offices in the local church. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Any questions so far? Over what we've discussed? Okay. 1 Timothy 3. Timothy 3, we're going to start in verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. And the Apostle Paul puts this is a true saying. I love that. This is it, it is a good thing, it is a blessing when a young man, a saved young man, feels God's call on his life to full-time Christian service. In the, in the verse here, especially in the office of a pastor. If a man desire the office of a bishop, that's the administrative part of the pastorate, he desires a good work, and he gives the requirements of what a pastor is to be. A bishop, then, verse 2, must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, but covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Very important. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without lest he fall into the reproach and snare of the devil. These are very, very high qualifications for a man who wants to be a pastor. For the pastor, the pastor must be these things. Blameless, 
He has to have a clean record, a clean conversation, a clean lifestyle. No one can have a handle on his life. The husband of one wife, he's been married to one, he's been married to one wife, never been divorced, vigilant, sober, he's given hospitality. Verses 4 and 5 tell us that he has to be one who uh, takes, leads his family well, that his kids are behaving. That's important. He's not immature spiritually, verse 6, and he must have a good testimony from the unbelieving community. Then he talks about the deacons. That's This is the second office. So the pastor and then the deacons. And then he gives the list of qualifications there. Quite similar to that of the pastor. It also talks about the deacons' wives, verse 11. The deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling the children in their own houses well. Very similar to um, verses 4 and 5 for the pastor. There are two offices in the local church, a pastor, the pastor, and deacons. Now, a church can have multiple deacons. Acts chapter 6, we won't look at there today, but when the Grecian widows were being neglected, the apostles decided that there had to be someone, some people, men, who could administer to the physical needs of the ladies and of the church in general. And so they tell the congregation, you pick out seven men who are of honest report, who are full of the Holy Spirit, who can meet the needs physically of the local church. While the apostles, or in this case, later on, the pastor, gives himself to the Word of God and to prayer. And that church had seven. Seven men, Stephen the martyr being one of them. So there's two offices in the local church, pastor and deacons. All right? One more. Separation. Now it comes to the, begs the question, Separation from what? Separation from what? Good question. Let's start with Matthew chapter 22. Let's look in, let's look there. Matthew start there. And they sent down unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth, neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? We are in Matthew chapter 22 in our Bibles, verse 17. I love Jesus' response in verse 18. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Whose is image, whose is his image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God things that are God's. 
when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Jesus knew what the Pharisees were after. He knew that they were tempting him. That's why he asked in verse 18, why are you testing me? Because he as the son of God already knew what they were up to. And the question was, is it right, is it lawful for us to give our taxes to Caesar? Jesus uses the actual object of discussion to give us the answer. Whose picture, whose superscription is on this coin? And they said Caesar's. You know what he's telling there in verse 21? What belongs to Caesar, you give to Caesar. You know what he's saying? Pay your taxes. Pay your taxes. What belongs to our leaders, we give to them. Our taxes. And I want to say something that may convict some of us. And I know it convicts me too. Give them respect. We find in 1 Timothy 2 that our leaders need prayer. I will therefore that prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. But he does say afterward, render unto God the things that belong to God. So separation, when we're talking about separation, number one, separation of church and state. Separation of church and state. In 312 AD, Constantine, Emperor Constantine, won a victory. And he believed that he would win that victory in battle when he received a vision. It had a cross in it. And in Latin, there was words across the cross which said, In this sign, conquer. And so based on that vision, he went into battle. And he won. 313, he made a very political move to make Christianity the state religion of the Roman Empire. You know what that is? That's a wedding with church and state together. And what is the result of it? The Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church came out of it, out of that decision. And then you have men like Augustine who actually would develop the theology for it without knowing it. And as the church what had it became the state religion, it started to go more away from this and develop its own doctrines. Like, sprinkling when it comes to baptism, when it comes to lifting up Mary, worshiping of Mary, incense, that's what happened. So number one, separation of church and state. That goes back to this as well, the autonomy of the local church, where we are under Christ. We are not under the government. We follow Him. We follow whatever what God belongs to God, we give to Him, which is Sunday worship, meeting together, doing the Lord's table, obeying believers' baptism. Number two, personal separation. Personal separation. Let's go to Romans 12. I want to look into this verse specifically. Right. Romans 12. Good to see you, Brother Wallace. And Josiah, good to see you again. Glad you're here. 
Now, I talked about verse 1 already, the importance of giving ourselves as a living sacrifice to God, doing whatever He calls us to do. After that comes verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The word conform has the idea of being molded into a pattern. Like your ice cubes, when you put them in water, they came from a mold, like an ice tray. And as it's being hardened by being in freezing environment, they become molded into each little component in the ice tray. God tells us to not be molded to the world schematic, to the world's um, pattern, but be transformed. You find in the Greek the word transformed is the word metamorphosis, where we get where we get the idea of a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Transformed by the renewing of our mind as we look into the Bible and let the Bible um, cleanse our thinking and we actually begin to meditate on what God's Word says, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God calls us as His people to separate from the world's philosophy, the world's thinking. He doesn't call us to be hermits or to be isolated from the world. That's impossible. That's not what He calls us to do. He calls us to be separate from the world's thinking and philosophy. And lastly, the third area of separation is ecclesiastical separation. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6. So ecclesiastical separation is more on the scale of the church. All right? And I'll explain what I mean. Let's, let's just read verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. He says in verse 16, ye are the temple of the living God. In the King James, the word ye is the plural form of you. You all are the temple of the living God. The church is the pillar and ground of truth, and God wants to have fellowship and communion with His bride, the local church, he wants to dwell among us, so to speak, and have His presence with us. So He tells us, come out from among them and be separate. Now in verses 14 and 15, He gives us the first few questions, hypothetical questions. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? And He keeps on going. The idea here is that as a church, we are to separate ourselves from corporations or organizations that are not in adherence to this. There is an organization called the World Council of Churches where it's more of an ecumenical organization. Oh, let's just gather around the gospel, whatever it is. They're not clear on what the gospel is. They don't 
really adhere to the Bible. We can't be a part of that. Any organization that they call themselves Christian, but they're not obeying this, or they're compromising on areas of doctrine, God calls us to separate them as a church. As a church. I'll read one more passage, just one verse, one more verse, and then we'll close. And you don't have to turn there. I'll just read it. It's in Galatians 1, verse 8. It says, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let it be accursed. How strong the Apostle Paul is when it comes to the gospel. Any organization that does not preach the correct gospel, the pure gospel, Christ died, was buried, rose again on the third day, and on Him alone we, we find our salvation. If they do not preach that, we must separate from them as a church. As a church, we must be united around the truth. So, these are the Baptist distinctives. And we found them all from the Scriptures. But we're, the next several weeks, we're going to uh, go through each of these individually and talk more about them. It all comes back to here. The first one. The B in the acrostic. The Bible is the authority for faith and practice. If, we, if the Bible is the inspired word of God, we will follow what it says, and we will believe and obey what it says. Let's close in prayer, and then we'll get ready for the morning service. Lord, we're so thankful for the word of God. Thank you for our time together around your word, and I pray that you would keep in mind these things which we have learned. And Lord, I look to you to bless the morning service. I pray Amen. that Pastor Christopher would be anointed with your spirit and that he would, you would give us exactly what we need from your word today. Amen. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name.